Hello, everyone. I'm Kamran. And I'm Billy. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors. Today, we will be discussing Book 1, Chapter 3 of Memories of Ice, a novel in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. This is Part 2 of our coverage of this chapter. This podcast series will have a minimum number of flair of at least 13 digressions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. You're going to put a quote on it now? Okay. I can't, I'm not. I'm not. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, that could be a high number. It's like, I don't want to be approached by one of our fans going, you only had 12 digressions, sir. It's like, <laughs> so this podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the book set in the Malaysian universe. It's not a book review, and it's most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading the books. Know that Cameron and I know that this series is the best fantasy story ever written, and we're approaching this from a purely fanboy point of view. No literary critique of Mr. Erickson. Just love. We'll be covering the events of the books in a linear fashion. There will be spoilers for those that haven't read the books. We'll try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that portion of the respective book. A quick warning to this episode may contain descriptions of possible violence, but it's maybe not recommended for children anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> our show is listener supported. If you'd like to support us, we'd really appreciate it. You can do so by visiting our Patreon link on our website at horsefrogproductions.com. Currently, we're posting ad-free episodes on Patreon Weekly. Also, we'd really like to hear from you, and we really mean that, so send any feedback or comments that you've got to contact at horsefraudproductions.com. All right, Chapter 3, Part 2. We pick up the chapter in Brood's command tent. Brood sighed and gestured to Herlokel. He said, find us that map of the Panion Domin territories. With the large map laid out, the others slowly gathered round the table. After a moment, Dujek grunted, then said, none of our own maps are this detailed. You've noted the locations of various Panyan armies. How recent is this? Brood said three days. Crone's cousins are there, tracking movements. The notes referring to the Panyan's means of organization and past tactics have been culled from various sources. As you can see, they're poised to take the city of Kapustan. Marek, Seda, and Lest have all fallen within the past four months. The Panyan's forces are still on the south side of the Catlin River, but preparations for the crossing have begun. Geographically, Kapustan is directly east of Darujistan, lying on the coast of Genabakis. The Panyan Daman is working its way north. Marik, Seda, and Lest all lie south of Kapustan. Dujek asked, the Kapustan army won't contest that crossing? If not, then they're virtually inviting a siege. I take it no one expects Kapustan to put up much of a fight. Brood said, the situation in Kapustan is a bit confused. The city's ruled by a prince and a coalition of high priests, and the two factions are ever at odds with each other. Problems have been compounded by the prince's hiring a mercenary company to augment his own minimal forces. Whiskey Jack asked, what company? Brood said, the Grey Swords. Have you heard of them, Commander? Whiskey Jack said, no. Brood said, nor have I. It's said they're up from Ellengarth. A decent compliment. Over 7,000. Whether they'll prove worthy of the usurious fees they've carved from the prince remains to be seen. Hood knows their so-called standard contract is almost twice the coin of what the Crimson Guard demands. Wow. Those are some expensive mercenaries. The Crimson Guard are quite formidable, so I don't think that their fees would be that low. Exactly, and I, and I know, and I forgot that these boys asked for more than the Crimson Guard asked for. wonder what that says about them. I hope good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And a quick reminder, Ellengarth is the city on the southern coast of Genabacus that Munug claimed as the origin of the ivory he used to carve the Torx picker, quote unquote, purchased from him. <laughs> I don't know whether it's picker or Dujex treasury that purchased right? the... Well, yeah, yeah, good question. In a tone that suggested boredom, Kalor added, their commander read the situation. Prince Jellarkan has more coin than soldiers, and the Panions won't be bought off. It's a holy war as far as the seer is concerned, after all. To worsen matters, the Council of High Priests has the backing of each temple's private company of highly trained, well-equipped soldiers. That's almost 3,000 of the city's most able fighters, whilst the prince himself has been left with dregs for his own Kapenthal, which he's prevented from expanding beyond 2,000 by law. For years, the Mass Council, the Coalition of Temples, has been using the Kapenthal as a recruiting ground for their own companies, bribing away the best. Clearly, the Mib wasn't alone in suspecting that, given the opportunity, Kalor would have gone on all afternoon, for Whiskey Jack <laughs> interrupted the man as he drew breath. <laughs> Remember how long-winded he was in the prologue? He sure likes the sound of his own voice. Typical Bond villain. Just can't, <laughs> can't stop telling you the whole everything. Whiskey Jack said, so this Prince Jellarkan circumvented the law by hiring mercenaries. Brood replied, correct. 
In any case, the Mass Council has managed to invoke yet another law, preventing the Grey Swords from active engagement beyond the city walls, so the crossing will not be contested. This bureaucracy. Did Mr. Erickson use the U.S. government as a model for this? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm assuming so. Uh, I believe most governments eventually get to function like this to some degree or another, but yes, I very mm. much believe it would be us at this point. <laughs> Mired in red tape. Yes. Dujek growled, idiots. Given this is a holy war, you'd think the temples would do all they could to effect a united front against the Panyans. Kalor said, I imagine they believe they are, with a sneer that could have been meant for Dujek or the priest in Kapustan, or both, he went on, while at the same time ensuring that the prince's power remains held in check. Brood said, it's more complicated than that. The ruler of Marik capitulated with little bloodshed by arresting all the priests in her city and handing them over to the Panyans' Teniscauri. In one move, she saved her city and its citizens, topped up her royal coffers with booty from the temples, and got rid of an eternal thorn in her side. The Panyan seer granted her a governorship, which is better than being torn apart and devoured by the Teniscauri, which is what happened to the priests. The Maib hissed, torn apart and devoured? Brood said, I, the Teniscauri are the seer's peasant army. They're fanatics that the seer doesn't bother supplying. Indeed, he's given them his holy blessing to do whatever is necessary to feed and arm themselves. If certain other rumors are true, then cannibalism is the least of the horrors. This concept is absolutely horrific. A starving horde of peasants descending upon a city with the remit to do whatever is required to sustain themselves. Very horrific. And I don't mean to say this with any kind of respect, but it's kind of brilliant in a way because you don't expand any of your real troops here. These are just your fanatic peasants. Apparently, it's like, so these are fodder to begin with. A boiling, frothing mob that just, yeah. It, I imagine it looking like the zombies in yeah. world war z i imagine it looks a lot like those zombies trying to climb those walls yeah yeah very much so and if they're hungry man these are some, these people are hungry it's like get them some food but it's kind of like i said it's horrific because you're not feeding them so you don't care if you lose them in a, an extent so it doesn't really hurt you like i said because you're mostly pres you're preserving your troops and who are fed i'm assuming hopefully not being fed the tennis gallery <laughs> hopefully this is not a vicious, vicious cycle here right Dujek muttered, we've heard similar rumors. So, Warlord, the question before us is, do we seek to save Kapustan or let it fall? The seer must know we're coming. His followers have spread the cult far beyond his borders, in Darujistan, in Pale, in Saltoan, meaning he knows we'll be crossing Catlin River somewhere, some when. If he takes Kapustan, then the river's widest ford is in his hands which leaves us with naught but the old ford west of Saltoan where the stone bridge used to be. Granted, our engineers could float us a bridge there, provided we bring the wood with us. That's the overland option in any case. We have two others, of course. Crone perched on the end of the table, cackled. Listen to him! The Mibe nodded, understanding Crone and experiencing her own amused disbelief. Dujek scowled down the length of the table at Crone. He asked, You have a problem, bird? Crone said, You are the warlord's match indeed. Word for word, you think aloud as he does. Oh, how can one not see the honed edge of poetry in your mutual war of the past 12 years? Brood commanded, Be quiet, Crone. Kapustan will be besieged. The Panyan's forces are formidable. We've learned that Septarch Culpath is commanding the expedition, and he's the ablest of all the seers' Septarchs. He has half the total numbers of Beklites with him. That's 50,000 regular infantry and a division of Erdemann besides the usual support attachments and auxiliary units. Kapustan is a small city, but the prince has worked hard on the walls, and the city's layout itself is peculiarly suited to district-by-district district defense. If the Grey Swords don't pull out with the first skirmish, Kapustan might hold for a time. Nonetheless, Dujek said, My Black Marath could land a few companies in the city, but without an explicit invitation to do so, tension could prove problematic. Kalor snorted, now that is an understatement. What city on Genebacus would welcome Malazan legions into their midst? More, you'd have to bring your own food. You can be sure of that, High Fist, not to mention face outright hostility, if not actual betrayal from the Kappan people. Whiskey Jack said, It's clear that we need to establish preliminary contact with Kapustan's prince. Silver Fox giggled, startling everyone. She said, All this orchestration, Uncle. You've already set in motion a plan to do so. You and the one-armed soldier have schemed this to the last detail. You plan on liberating Kapustan, though of course not directly. You two never do anything directly, do you? You want to remain hidden behind the events, a classic Malazan tactic, if ever there was one. Like the master gamblers they were, the two men showed no expression at her words. 
Calor's chuckle was a soft rattle of bones. The mime studied Whiskey Jack and thought, The child's so very alarming, isn't she? By the spirits, she alarms even me. And I know so much more than you do, sir. After a moment, Brood said, Well, I'm delighted to hear we're in agreement. Capistan mustn't fall if we can help it. And an indirect means of relief is probably the best option, all things considered. On the surface, we must be seen, the majority of your forces as well as mine, one arm, to be marching overland at a predictable pace. That will establish Septarch Culpath's timetable for the siege, for both him and us. I take it we're also agreed that Capistan must not be our sole focus. Dujek slowly nodded and said, It may still fall despite our efforts. If we're to defeat the Panion Daman, we must strike for its heart. Brood said, Agreed. Tell me, one arm, which city have you targeted for this first season of the campaign? Whiskey Jack immediately said, Coral. All eyes returned to the map. Brood was grinning. He said, It seems we do indeed think alike. Once we reach the northern border of the Daman, we drive like a spear southward, a swift succession of liberated cities. Seta, Lest, Marek, won't the governess be pleased? <laughs> then to Coral itself. We undo in a single season the seer's gains over the past four years. I want that cult reeling. I want crack sent right through the damn thing. Whiskey Jack said, aye, warlord. So we march overland, yes? No boats. That would hasten Culpath's hand, after all. There's one more issue to clarify, however. His gray eyes swung to Corlat. He said, and that is, what can we expect from Animander Ray? Corlat, will the Tistandee be with us? Corlat simply smiled. Brood cleared his throat and said, like you, we have initiated some moves of our own. As we speak, Moonspawn travels towards the Daman. Before it reaches the Seer's territory, it will disappear. Dujak raised his brows and said, an impressive feat. Crone cackled. How do you make a floating mountain disappear? I have no idea. <laughs> it's a really good question. How do you make it disappear? I'd like to see the logistics in that. Yes. I do enjoy the fact that Brood smiles over at Whiskey Jack when he says, we do think a lot over that, uh, over going to Coral. <laughs> mm -hmm. We do think a lot. Kind of like that. Brood said, we know little of the sorcery behind the seer's power, only that it exists. Like your Maranth, Moonspawn represents tactical opportunities we'd be fools not to exploit. Like you, High Fist, we seek to avoid predictability. He nodded towards Corlat and said, the Tistandi possess formidable sorceries. Silverfox interrupted, not enough. <laughs> Corlat frowned down at Silverfox and said, that is quite an assertion, child. Calor hissed, trust nothing of what she says. Indeed, as Brood well knows, I consider her presence at this meeting foolish. She is no ally of ours. She will betray us all, mark my words. Betrayal, it is her oldest friend. Hear me, all of you. This creature is an abomination. Silver Fox sighed. Oh, Calor, must you always go on like that? Dude, Calor has quite a low opinion of her to be talking to her this way. Yes, he does. And what's funny to me is that last episode, you had mentioned something about Elia or Elia from Dune. And we were talking about her talking to her grandfather. It's like, it's kind of that same vibe almost here. He's like, I trust nothing of what she says, indeed. He's <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> just, just pointing your face. He's like, oh, Kala. <laughs> yeah, it's just real <laughs> casual. <laughs> yeah, coming from somebody 10, 11 years old in appearance, that would be unsettling. Yeah. Dujek turned to Caladan Brood and said, Warlord, I admit to some confusion over the girl's presence. Who in Hood's name is she? She seems in possession of preternatural knowledge. For what seems a ten-year-old child, Calor stared at Silver Fox with hard, hate-filled eyes as he snapped. She is far more than that. Look at the hag beside her. She's barely seen twenty summers, High Fist, and this child was torn from her womb not six months ago. The abomination feeds on the life force of her mother. No, not mother. The unfortunate vessel that once hosted the child. You all shivered at the cannibalism of the Teniscari? What think you of a creature that so devours the life soul of the one who birthed it? And there is more. He stopped, visibly bit back what he was about to say, and sat back. He said, she should be killed. Now, before her power surpasses us all. There was silence within the tent. His use of the word hag here when referring to the Mib is uncalled for. She didn't do anything to him to deserve that language. <laughs> I agree, but it's his calor. Be glad he didn't punch her in the face for looking at him like that. I mean, <laughs> he's a very unpleasant person, he appears to be. I mean, dude, we met him at the beginning of the book. He burned up a whole continent just to keep him from justice being served on him. <laughs> yeah. How we say things is how we think things. And when he's referring to her as hag and the girl's abomination, yeah. he's really internalized this message. This is true. I had thought about it like that, but very true. 
The Mib thought, damn you, Kalor. Is this what you want to show our newfound allies? A camp divided and spirits below. Damn you a second time, for she never knew. She never knew. Trembling, the Mib looked down at Silver Fox. The girl's eyes were wide, even now filling with tears as she stared up at her mother. She whispered, do I? Do I feed on you? That's a lot to take in as a child, even one that has the strange knowledge that she has. Yes, agreed. As I think we can agree, knowledge is not experience. Mm -hmm. You can have perfect knowledge and still not have the experience to apply it to in a weird way. That's kind of a weird way. You know what I'm talking about. And this is kind of like that, right? Oh, yeah, like, oh. definitely. Theoretical knowledge as opposed yes. to lived experience. Yes, yes. She should have known that herself, I think, if she would have just thought about it. Probably she would have spotted it. She's smart enough. It's just that she's never thought about it. She's been too busy growing fast. Yeah, it's weird trying to think about what her mind thinks like because she yeah. has these ancient memories, seemingly. But at the same time, there is some childlike component to it. Yeah. And those older souls, they do bleed through. But sometimes when, like right here, it just seems like she's a kid. Exactly. Exactly. She's just a kid because she's been talking like someone who's older than anyone else in the room, except for Galler, maybe. But then that one moment reveals a real terrible naivete. Right. The Mibe closed her eyes, wishing she could hide the truth from Silver Fox once again and forevermore. Instead, she said, not your choice, daughter. It is simply part of what you are. And I accept this, she thought, and yet rage at the foul cruelty of it. The Mibe went on. As must you. There is an urgency within you, Silver Fox, a force ancient and undeniable. You know it as well. Feel it. Kalor rasped. Ancient and undeniable? You don't know the half of it, woman. He jolted forward across the table and grasped Silver Fox tunic, pulled her close, their faces inches apart. The High King bared his teeth. He said, you're in there, aren't you? I know it. I feel it. Come out, bitch. Brood commanded, release her in a low, soft voice. Kalor's sneer broadened. He released his grip on the girl's tunic, slowly leaned back. That's pretty bold of him, given the company that he's in. Well, I'm assuming the only reason the girl lives through that encounter is due to the company that Kalor's in. <laughs> yeah, but for him to lose control like that, yeah. either he was consumed by his hatred, because you would think he'd have a more tactical means of handling this, so he mm -hmm. must have been overtaken with emotion here. There is that because I forget until it's only through this read for some reason that I really sinks in. You know, the beginning of the book points out the people who came and took Cowler down. And here he is with one of them, part of one of them. And it's kind of like, oh, yeah, I kind of forget that sometimes until you get to examining it like we do. And you're like, oh, yeah, he probably is angry. I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's pretty, pretty ticked off. I mean, she is one of the people that put him in this current sorry state. On the topic of forgiveness, Billy. Yes. <laughs> Kalor, just forgive her, baby. You feel a lot better about yourself. <laughs> it's a long time to hold a grudge. Oh, man. That's probably the only thing keeping him alive. You know that what? Right. Him wanting to take out all three of these folks that did this to him is, I think, the only thing that keeps that old boy going. You're probably right. Heart pounding, the Mibe raised a trembling hand to her face. Terror had ripped through her when Kalor had grasped her daughter an icy flood that left her limbs without strength, vanquishing with ease her maternal instinct to defend, revealing to herself and to everyone present her own cowardice. She felt tears of shame well in her eyes, trickle down her lined cheeks. I don't mean to bring something else back. Something else dawned on me with Cowler. Do you think that if he just, would his curse be such that even if, let's just say he tried to give up and just lay there and die, that he would not, in fact, die? Probably. They cursed him with long life, didn't they? Yeah, that's so I'm thinking that he would just he may not be able to even move due to weakness, if not maybe trying to starve himself to death, but not being able to die, dude. That's really awful. <laughs> be like one of those jagoots with the rock on top of him. That's exactly what I was <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. Well, you obviously think we we've read these books too many times, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Is there such thing as too many times? No, sir. I think so. There's better understanding to be had each read. Mm-hmm. Brood said, touch her again and I will beat you senseless, Kalor. <laughs> Kalor said, as you like. Armor rustled as Whiskey Jack turned to Caladan Brood. His face was dark, his expression harsh. He said, had you not done so, Warlord, I would have voiced my own threat. He fixed iron eyes on Kalor and said, harm a child? I would not beat you senseless, Kalor. I would rip your heart out. Kalor grinned and said, indeed, I shake with fear. Whiskey Jack murmured, that will do. His gauntleted left hand lashed out in a backhanded slap, striking Kalor's face. 
blood sprayed across the table as his head snapped back. The force of the blow staggered him. The handle of his bastard sword was suddenly in his hands, the sword hissing, then halting, half drawn. Kalor could not move his arms further, for Caladan Brood now gripped both wrists. Kalor strained, blood vessels swelling on his neck and temple, achieving nothing. Brood must have tightened his huge hands then, for he gasped, the sword's handle dropping from his grasp, the weapon thunking back into the scabbard. Brood stepped closer, but the Maib heard his soft words nonetheless. Accept what you have earned, Kalor. I have had quite enough of your contempt at this gathering. Any further test of my temper and it shall be my hammer striking your face. Understood? After a long moment, Kalor grunted. Brood released him. Dude. He really got put in his place there. Mm. I imagine his eyes turned red with rage. Dude, what a scene, too. Dude, what a great scene that is. Man. And yes, yeah, but he's insanely livid right here. I cannot imagine how angry he Because something is born of this, is it not, sir? How could it not be? Yes. The backhand. Yes. <laughs> such a, I'm thinking of it getting punched in the face is one thing. Mm -hmm. Open hand slap is another thing. Mm -hmm. But a backhand... It's, it's like, almost like a sign of dominance, a level above. <laughs> it's the, there's a guy I watch that reviews horror movies and he talks about a lot of old horror movies that I know and own and see. And it's like the old seven, he goes, gives them the old pimp slap. You know, that's, that's kind of what that is. It's kind of like, whoa, <laughs> like, that's that kind of shot that you're right. It's that kind of, you ain't even worth an open handed slap to the face. You're worth the back of the hand. Yeah. Being on the receiving end of that and being restrained unable to yes. do anything that's yes. where it's like you could the blood vessel i'd be like i'm surprised his head didn't explode yeah what a scene good <laughs> golly what a scene it's almost as bad except it's the opposite it's tombstone oh <laughs> oh <laughs> except In that that wagon. Kurt, except that kurt russell is holding billy bob thornton's hands at his side you know it's taunting him this you know man oh i just watched that again the other day it holds up yeah, okay. so good. I need to watch it, dude. I've been wanting to rewatch a good Western. I've been needing one. Silence filled the tent, no one moving. All eyes on Kalor's bleeding face. Dujek withdrew a cloth from his belt, crusted with dried shaving soap, and <laughs> tossed it at the High King. He growled, <laughs> keep it. I know this is a serious scene, but this reminds me of Dujek cursing the barber for leaving <laughs> soap on his face in Gardens of the Moon. And I imagine that barber is still doing it if the cloth still has the soap on it. I'm just assuming that this is dried up soap from Gardens of the Moon. I'm sorry. <laughs> so you're saying that's the rag that Callet threw to Dujek? Yeah. Yeah, probably so. Interesting. Okay. I don't know why. It's just, I, I want some continuity there. Yeah, that'd be cool if it was. <laughs> that's almost more insulting too. It's like, wipe yourself off. It's kind of like- With my dirty <laughs> rag. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like wipe yourself off. You look ridiculous. It's kind of like that. Oh, God. God. They all, they all three, just all three. I just now, it's kind of all. Even that is almost an insult. So all three of them have personally just insulted Calor gravely. Continents have died for less. <laughs> I was gonna say this dude has done some bad stuff in his yeah. time, and he's been around a lot longer than all these people, except for maybe Caladan Brood. We don't know how old he is. Yes, you don't want to piss off people like this. No. You know, no, you don't. But I understand the honorable thing to do is what Whiskey Jack did. I'm just saying, you never know what doors you're opening when you're dealing with individuals like Calor. Yes, <laughs> someone as crazy as that guy is. The Mibe moved up behind a pale, wide eyed silver fox and laid her hands on her daughter's shoulders. She whispered, No more, please. Whiskey Jack faced Brood once again, ignoring Calor as if the man had ceased to exist. He said, Explain, please, warlord. What in Hood's name is this child? Shrugging her mother's hands from her shoulders, Silver Fox stood poised as if about to flee. Then she shook her head, wiped her eyes, and drew a shuddering breath. She said, No, let none answer but me. She looked up at her mother, the briefest meeting of gazes, then surveyed the others once more. She whispered, In all things, let none answer but me. The Mibe reached out a hand, but could not touch. She said, You must accept it, daughter. She thought, You must forgive. Forgive yourself. O oh, spirits below, I dare not speak such words. I have lost that right. I have surely lost it now. Silver Fox turned to Whiskey Jack and said, The truth now, uncle. I am born of two souls, one of whom you knew very well, the woman Tattersail. The other soul belonged to the discorporate, ravaged remnants of a high mage named Nightchill. In truth, little more than her charred flesh and bones, though other fragments of her were preserved as a consequence of a sealing spell. Tattersail's death occurred within the sphere of the Talon Warren, as projected by a Talani mass. 
The Mai Balone saw the standard bear Artanthos flinch. She thought, and what, sir, do you know of this? Again, suspicious behavior from Artanthos. Yes, shenanigans, sir. <laughs> I call I'm shenanigans. Called, I call shenanigans. Silver Fox continued, within that influence, uncle, something happened. Something unexpected. A bone caster from the distant past appeared, as did an elder god, an immortal soul. Cloth held to his face, Kalor's snort was muffled. He murmured, night chill, such a lack of imagination. Did Cruel even know? Ah, what irony. Silver Fox resumed. It was these three who gathered to help my mother, this Reevy woman who found herself with an impossible child. I was born in two places at once, among the Reevy in this world and into the hands of the Bonecaster in the Talon Warren. She hesitated, shuddering as if suddenly spent. After a moment, she drew her arms around herself and whispered, My future belongs to the Talani Mass. She spun suddenly to Corlat and said, They're gathering, and you will need their power in the war to come. Kalor rasped, unholy conjoining, as I had feared. Oh, you fools, every one of you, fools. Corlat said, gathering? Why? To what end, Silver Fox? Silver Fox said, that is for me to decide, for I exist to command them, to command them all. My birth proclaimed the gathering, a demand that every Talani mass on this world has heard. And now, those who are able are coming. They are coming. Oh, man, that's got to be something. <laughs> It's a family reunion, buddy. Who's bringing the slaw? <laughs> they haven't all been together since they took the vow, correct? I think you are correct. Now, if the Logros are enough to instill fear, the Logros were who worked for the Emperor, correct? Yes. And so, uh, how many clans are going to be there? Who's the headlining act? Do they go on after Van Halen? <laughs> you know, I'm just blown away. What's going on here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The implication is there could be quite a few. Yes, because just a handful of Talani mass are horrifying. I mean, they seem to make ascendants pretty nervous when any of these guys get together. <laughs> so it's like, there's going to be several of these folks hanging out in one spot. It's kind of like, how many mm -hmm. is this? How many is going to be? In his mind, Whiskey Jack was reeling. Fisher's and Brood's contingent was alarming enough. But the child's revelations, his thoughts spun. The command tent and its confines slipped away, and he found himself in a world of twisted schemes, dark betrayals, and their fierce, unexpected consequences. A world he hated with a passion. Memories rose like specters. The enfilade at Pale. The decimation of the bridge burners. The assault on Moonspawn. A plague of suspicions. A maelstrom of desperate schemes. He thought Acheronis, Bellardan, Nightchill, Tattersail. The list of mages whose deaths could be laid at High Mage Tatrin's feet was written in the blood of senseless paranoia. Whiskey Jack had not been sorry to see the High Mage take his leave, though the commander suspected he was not as far off as it seemed. He thought, Outlawry. Lacine's proclamation cut us loose, but it's all a lie. Only he and Dujak knew the truth of that. The remainder of the hosts believed they had indeed been outlawed by the Empress. Their loyalty was to Dujak one arm, he thought, and perhaps to me as well. And who knows, we'll test that loyalty before we're done. Yet she knows. The girl knows. He had no doubt that she was Tattersail Reborn. The sorceress was there, in the cast of the child's features, in the way she stood and moved in that sleepy, knowing gaze. The repercussions that tumbled from that truth overwhelmed Whiskey Jack. He needed time to think. He thought, Tattersail Reborn, damn you to Hood, Tatrin. Inadvertent or not, what have you done? Whiskey Jack had not known Nightchill. They'd never spoken, and the breadth of his knowledge was based solely on the tales he'd heard. Mate to the Thelomen, Bellardan, and a practitioner of High Rishan sorcery. She had been among the Emperor's chosen, ultimately betrayed, just as the bridge burners had been. Quick reminder, Rishan is the Warren of Darkness that is based on the absence of light, rather than the Warren of True Darkness, used by the Tist Andi, Kurald Galain. Is Rishan an offshoot of True Dark? Like what the humans have, or the like regular slash magic users might use in this world to get a hold of? Or is Rishan its own thing? There is a little ambiguity here. This is one of those rough areas that is not highly defined. Okay. I think it's referred to as the illusion warren. Oh, okay, okay. There had been an edge to night chill, it was said. A hint of jagged, blood-stained iron. And he could see what remained of that woman had cast a shadow over the child. The soft gleam in Tattersail's sleepy eyes had darkened, somehow, and seeing it frayed Whiskey Jack's already rattled nerves. He thought, oh, Hood. One of those repercussions had just settled in his mind with a thunderous clang. He thought, oh, the gods forgive us our foolish games. 
Back in pale waited Ganoa's Perrin, Tattersail's lover. What will he make of Silver Fox? From woman to a newborn babe in an instant, then from that newborn to a 10-year-old child in six months. And six months from now? A 20-year-old woman? Perrin, lad, is it grief that is burning holes in your gut? If so, then what will its answering do to you? Yeah, that's going to be a challenging situation for Perrin, no doubt. No doubt whatsoever. That's going to be very awkward. <laughs> yes. She was 200. He's in his 20s. And now it's a really weird juxtaposition. Yeah, but she won't be this age very long if she's only six months old and looking like 12. Yeah, I know. But then it makes you think, does that slow down eventually? Or does she continue to age at the same rate? Is it only because the Mibe's alive and when the Mibe's gone, she's going to have normal aging? A lot of questions. That could be. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, a lot of questions. As he struggled to comprehend Silver Fox's words and all that he saw in her face, his thoughts turned to the Mibe standing beside Silver Fox. Sorrow flooded him. The gods were cruel indeed. The old woman would likely be dead within the year, a brutal sacrifice to the child's needs. He thought a malign, nightmarish twist to the role of motherhood. The girl's final words jarred Whiskey Jack yet again. They are coming. The Talani Mass. Hood's breath, as if matters weren't complicated enough. Where do I place my faith in all this? Kalor, a cold, uncanny bastard himself, calls her an abomination. He would kill her if he could. That much is plain. I'll not abide harming a child. But is she a child? Yet, Hood's breath. She's Tattersail reborn, a woman of courage and integrity, and Nightchill, a high mage who served the Emperor. And, now, strangest, most alarming fact of all, she is the new ruler of the Talani Mass. That's such a complicated set of circumstances stacked together. Very convoluted. I would agree, sir. Sounds like a soap opera. <laughs> and next week on As the World <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, tomorrow on As Burn Sleeps. Yes. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> nice okay so that kind of takes us to Corlat and whiskey jack this some love triangle with the mibe you know <laughs> <laughs> well i'm curious now it, i just had another image in my mind you've seen thor ragnarok right yes remember at the very end of ragnarok when the thing comes to life and is destroying asgard yes the thing breaking is that what happens when burn guts loose is is burned asleep to keep the world safe i don't know i don't think so because if she's only been asleep for 1200 years then you have quite a long time before that where the world was around because the, the yeah. talani mass were here the first empire turned into whatever Daru just stands old yeah Daru stands old yeah so you have to assume that it was okay at least a couple thousand so mm -hmm. yeah i think you're right i'm just kind of curious i'm just wondering what this significance of that is is it not allow people access to the warren of burn or is that dress is it the same thing i think that is the warren of burn it will learn later here i think okay we know that the brood is tied to earth or burn is he tied to burn right he is yeah he carries the hammer for her for her okay that's what it is okay he's our champion yeah okay whiskey jack blinked the tent and its occupants coming into focus once again Silence writhing with tumultuous thoughts, his gaze swung back to Silver Fox, saw the paleness of her young, round face, noted with a pang of empathy the tremble in the child's hands, then away again. Corlat was watching him, their eyes locked. He thought, such extraordinary beauty, while Dujek is dog face ugly. Further proof I chose the wrong side all those years back. She's hardly interested in me that way. No, she's trying to say something else entirely. After a long moment, he nodded. Silver Fox, she's still a child, I. A clay tablet, scarcely etched. I, Tistandi, I understand you. Those who chose to stand close to Silver Fox might well be able to influence what she was to become. Corlat sought a private conversation with him, and he just accepted the invitation. Whiskey Jack wished he had Quick Ben at his side right now. He already felt out of his depth. He thought, Perrin, you poor bastard. What do I tell you? Should I arrange a meeting between you and Silver Fox? Will I be able to prevent one once you're told? Is it even any of my business? Crone's beak gaped, but not in soundless laughter this time. Instead, unfamiliar terror raced through her. She thought, Talani Mass, and Cruel, the Elder God, holders of the truth of the Great Ravens, a truth no one else knows except for Silver Fox, by the abyss, Silver Fox, who looked upon my soul and read all within it. Careless, careless child, would you force us to defend ourselves from you, from those whom you claim to command? We Great Ravens have never fought our own wars. Would you see us unleashed by your unmindful revelations? Should Rake learn, protestations of innocence will avail us not. We were there at the chaining, were we not? Yet, 
I. We were there at fall itself. The great ravens were born like maggots in the flesh of the fallen one, and that, oh, that will damn us. But wait, have we not been honorable guardians of the crippled god's magic? And were we not the ones who delivered to one and all the news of the Panion Daman, the threat it represents? A magic we can unleash, if forced to. Ah, child, you threaten so much with your careless words. Her black, glittering eyes sought out and fixed on Caladan Brood. Whatever thoughts he possessed remained hidden. Crone thought, Reign in your panic, old hag. Return to the concerns before us. Think. The Malazan Empire had made use of the Talani Mass in the Emperor's time. The conquest of seven cities had been the result. Then, with Kelonved's death, the alliance had dissolved, and so Genebacus was spared the devastating implacability of tens of thousands of undead warriors who could travel as dust in the wind. This alone had allowed Caladan Brood to meet the Malazan threat on equal footing. Crone thought, ah, perhaps it only seemed that way. Has he ever truly unleashed the Tistandi? Has he ever let loose Anamander Rake? Has he ever shown his own true power? Brood's an ascendant. One forgets that in careless times. His warren is tennis. You had mentioned you thought it was Driss. I guess it's tennis. It's tennis, okay. The power of the land itself. The earth that is home to the eternal sleeping goddess, Burn. Caladan Brood has the power, there in his arms and in that formidable hammer on his back, to shatter mountains. In exaggeration, a low flight over the broken peaks east of the Lateron Plateau is proof enough of his younger, more precipitous days. Grandmother Crone, you should know better. Power draws power. It has always been thus. And now have come the Talani Mass, and once again the balance shifts. That's wild that the hammer at his back can shatter mountains, and he has the strength to wield it. And has, in fact, wielded it, and apparently knocked down some mountains. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Or knocked the tops off of them, off of at least. Uh-huh. Okay. I imagine there's a scene in One Punch Man, the anime, where he does his serious punch and it parts the clouds right. across half the earth when he does it. <laughs> and I imagine that when this hammer hits the ground, it does something similar where a valley opens between two ridges and it goes way out, miles yes. and miles. It'd be crazy. <laughs> I can see that too. Yeah, it was too funny. Crone's thoughts continued. My children spy upon the Panion Daman. They can smell the power rising from those lands, so thoroughly sanctified in blood. Yet it remains faceless, as if hidden beneath layer after deceiving layer. What hides at the core of that empire of fanatics? The horrific child knows. I'd swear on the god's bed of broken flesh to that. Oh yes, and she will lead the Talani Mass to that very heart. Do you grasp this, Caladan Brood? I think you do. And even as that hoary old tyrant Kalor utters his warnings with a bloodless will, even as you are rocked by the imminent arrival of undead allies, so you are jolted even more by the fact that they will be needed. Against what have we proclaimed war? What will be left of us when we are done? And by the abyss, what secret truth about Silver Fox does Kalor possess? Defying her own overwhelming self-disgust, the Mibe forced brutal clarity into her thoughts, listening to all that Silver Fox said, to each word, to what lay between each word. She hugged herself beneath the barrage of her daughter's pronouncements. She finally understood something of the position in which Silver Fox had found herself. The confessions were a call for help. I'm having difficulty understanding why the Mibe is so disgusted with herself. Do you have any insights there? I have none. I'm like you. I don't know... Why? I mean, unless she's mad that it got revealed that Silver Fox is draining off her life and going to kill her, unless, unless she was mad about that and is disgusted with herself from hiding that from her. I mean, I don't know. Do you think it could be her reaction when Kalor grasped Silver Fox's tunic and she froze instead of taking action? Do you think that's what she's disgusted with? Her perceived weakness? Maybe. I have a hard time understanding why there is a self disgust there. Okay. I got no idea why. The Mibe thought. She needs allies. She knows I am not enough. Spirits below. She has been shown that here. More, she knows that these two camps, enemies for so long, need to be bridged. Born in one, she reaches out to the other. All that was Tattersail and Nightchill cries out to old comrades. Will they answer? The Mibe could discern nothing of Whiskey Jack's emotions. His thoughts might well be echoing Kalor's position. An abomination. She saw him meet Corlat's eyes and wondered at what passed between them. She thought, think. It is the nature of everyone here to treat every situation tactically, to push away personal feelings, to gauge, to weigh and balance. Silver Fox has stepped to the fore. 
She has claimed a position of power to rival Brood, Animander Rake, and Kalor. Does Dujek One-Arm now wonder with whom he should be dealing? Does he realize that we are all united because of him? That for 12 years, the clans of Bargast and Rivi, the disparate companies from a score or more cities, the Tistandi, the presence of Rake, Brood, and Kalor, not to mention the Crimson Guard, all of us, we stood shoulder to shoulder because of the Malazan Empire, because of the High Fist himself. But we have a new enemy now, and much of its nature remains unknown, and it has engendered a kind of fragility among us. Oh, what an understatement, that Dujek one arm now sees. Silver Fox states that we shall have need of the Talani mass. Only the vicious old emperor could have been comfortable with such creatures as allies. Even Kalor recoils from what is being forced upon us. The fragile alliance now creaks and totters. You are too wise a man, High Fist, to not now possess grave doubts. Dujek was the first to speak after Silver Fox's statement, and he addressed the child with slow, carefully measured words. The Talani mass with whom the Malazan Empire is familiar is the army commanded by Logros. By your words, we must assume there are other armies, yet no knowledge of them has ever reached us. Why is that, child? Silver Fox said, The last gathering was hundreds of thousands of years ago, at which was involved the ritual of Talon, the binding of the Talon worn to each and every eye mass. The ritual made them immortal, High Fist. The life force of an entire people was bound in the name of a holy war destined to last for millennia. Kalor rasped, against the Jagut. Apart from a handful of tyrants, the Jagut were pacifists. Their only crime was to exist. Silver Fox rounded on Kalor. She said, do not hint at injustices, High King. I possess enough of Nightchill's memories to recall the Imperial Warren, the place you once ruled, Kalor, before the Malazans made claim to it. You laid waste an entire realm. You stripped the life from it, left nothing but ash and charred bones. An entire realm! Kalor's blood-smeared grin was ghastly. He said, ah, you are there, aren't you? But hiding, I think, twisting the truth into false memories. Hiding, you pathetic, cursed woman. His smile hardened, and he said, then you should know not to test my temper, bonecaster. Tattersail, night chill, dear child. The Mibe saw her daughter pale. She thought, between these two, the feel of long enmity. Why had I not seen that before? There are old memories here, a link between them, between my daughter and Kalor. No, between Kalor and one of the souls within her. After a long moment, Silver Fox returned her attention to Dujek. She said, to answer you, Logros and the clans under his command were entrusted with the task of defending the first throne. The other armies departed to hunt down the last Jagut strongholds. The Jagut had raised barriers of ice. Omtos Falak is a warren of ice, High Fist a place deathly cold and almost lifeless. Jagut sorceries threatened the world. Sea levels dropped. Whole species died out. Every mountain range was a barrier. Ice flowed in white rivers down from the slopes. Ice formed a league deep in places. As mortals, the Imas were scattered, their unity lost. They could not cross such barriers. There was starvation. Kalor snapped. The war against the Jagut had begun long before then. They sought to defend themselves, and who would not? To his point, this account from Silver Fox seems very lopsided in favor of the Talan IMS, does it not? Yes, it does. I am really curious to know the other side of this story. <laughs> yes. The true side of it, yeah. Yeah, we got a little bit of that in Dead House Gates with the Jagut ghost father that was communing with Corporal List. Yeah, the, the things they did to those the Jagut was awful. Yes. Silver Fox simply shrugged and said, As Talon undead, our armies could cross such barriers. The efforts at eradication proved costly. You have heard no whispers of those armies because many have been decimated, whilst others perhaps continue the war in distant, inhospitable places. There was a pained expression on Dujek's face. He said, The Logros themselves left the Empire and disappeared into the Jagodon for a time, and when they returned, they were much diminished. She nodded. Dujek asked, Have the Logros answered your call? Frowning, Silver Fox said, I cannot be certain of that, of any of them. They have heard. All will come if they are able, and I sense the nearness of one army, at least I think I do. The Mibe thought, there is so much you are not telling us, daughter. I can see it in your eyes. You fear your call for help will go unanswered if you reveal too much. Yes, a carefully edited history is being presented here, so I imagine there's going to be some skepticism from the people that are present as well. Yes, I can see that. <laughs> Dujek sighed and faced Brood, then said, Caladan Brood, shall we resume our discussion of strategy? The soldiers once again leaned over the map table, joined by a softly cackling crone. 
After a moment, the Mibe collected Silver Fox's hand and guided her towards the entrance. Corlat joined them as they made their way out. To the Mibe's surprise, Whiskey Jack followed. The cool afternoon breeze was welcome after the close confines of the command tent. Without a word, the small group walked a short distance to a clearing between the Tistandi and Bargast encampments. Once they halted, Whiskey Jack fixed his gray eyes on Silver Fox. He said, I see much of Tattersail in you, lass. How much of her life, her memories, do you recall? Silver Fox said, faces, and the feelings attached to them, Commander. You and I were allies for a time. We were, I think, friends. His nod was grave. He said, aye, we were. Do you remember Quick Ben, the rest of my squad? What of Hairlock, Tashrin? Do you recall Captain Perrin? She whispered, Quick Ben, a mage, seven cities, a man of secrets. Yes, Quick Ben, Hairlock, not a friend, a threat. He caused me pain, Whiskey Jack said. He's dead now. Silver Fox said, I am relieved. Tashrin is a name I've heard recently, Lacine's favorite high mage. We sparred, he and I, when I was Tattersail, and, indeed, when I was Nightchill. No sense of loyalty, no sense of trust. Thoughts of him confuse me, Whiskey Jack asked. And the captain? Something in Whiskey Jack's tone brought the Mibe alert. Silver Fox glanced away from Whiskey Jack's eyes. She said, I look forward to seeing him again. Whiskey Jack cleared his throat and said, He's in pale right now. Well, it's not my business, lass. You might want to consider the consequences of meeting him, of, uh, his finding out. His words trailed away in evident discomfort. The Mibe thought, Spirits below. This Captain Perrin was Tattersell's lover. I should have anticipated something like this. The souls of two grown women. She said, Silver Fox, daughter. Silver Fox interrupted. We have met him, mother, when driving the veteran north. Do you recall? The soldier who defied our lances? I knew then. I knew him. Who he was. She faced Whiskey Jack again and said, Perrin knows. Send him word that I am here, please. What a legendary scene when Perrin survived that attack from the Reavy. Mm -hmm. Really good scene. Great scene. He was shocked. <laughs> he anticipated that he was yeah. going to die. <laughs> All those lances flying at him. That great sword of his did its work. <laughs> Whiskey Jack said, Very well, lass. The bridge burners will be visiting in any case. The captain now commands them. I am sure that Quick Ben and Mallet will be pleased to make your reacquaintance. Silver Fox said, You wish them to examine me, you mean, to help you decide whether I am worthy of your support. Fear not, Commander. The prospect does not concern me. In many ways, I remain a mystery to myself as well, and so I am curious as to what they will discover. Whiskey Jack smiled wryly and said, You've the sorceress's blunt honesty, lass, if not her occasional tact. Corlat spoke. Commander Whiskey Jack, I believe we have things to discuss, you and I. He said, aye. Corlat turned to the Mive and Silver Fox and said, we shall take our leave of you two now. The Mive said, of course, as she struggled to master her emotions. She thought, the soldier who defied our lances. Oh yes, I recall, child. Old questions. Finally answered. A thousand more to plague this old woman. She said, come along, Silver Fox. It's time to resume your schooling in the ways of the Reavy. Silver Fox said, yes, mother. Whiskey Jack watched the two Reavy walk away. He said, she revealed far too much. The parlay was working, drawing the bindings closer. Then the child spoke. Corlat murmured, yes, she is in possession of secret knowledge, the knowledge of the Talani mass, memory spanning millennia on this world. So much that those people witnessed, the fall of the crippled god, the arrival of the Tistandi, the last flight of the dragons into Starvald Demolane. She fell silent, a veil descending over her eyes. The last flight of dragons into Starvald Demolane. I would like to know more. Well, think about this, the arrival of the Tist and D. So they may be as alien as something else here that was pulled down. They came from darkness. Yeah, but for some, I don't know why, for some reason, my brain always thinks of like, like maybe there was nothing at the beginning and in the darkness, something spawned and this world was part of that. But when I hear it like this, I'm like, no, the Talani mass had already taken the vow when the Tisti Andy had arrived. So I'm like, oh, okay. It does make it sound like that. I wonder if that's actually how it played out. Yeah, I'm curious. Well, I guess hopefully we'll find out. I guess we probably won't know until the Carcanus trilogy. Maybe when that finishes, if it's not already described in the timeline, maybe... It will be. Yes, let's hope. Let us hope so. <laughs> Whiskey Jack studied her, then said, I've never seen a great raven become so obviously flustered. Corlat smiled and said, Crone believes the secret of her kind's birth is not known to us. It is the shame of their origins, you see, or so they themselves view it. Rake is indifferent to its moral context, as we all are. Whiskey Jack asked, What is so shameful? 
Corlatt said, the great ravens are unnatural creatures. The bringing down of the alien being who would come to be called the crippled god was a violent event. Parts of him were torn away, falling like balls of fire to shatter entire lands. Pieces of his flesh and bone lay rotting, yet clinging to a kind of life in their massive craters. From that flesh, the great ravens were born, carrying with them fragments of the crippled god's power. You have seen Crone and her kin. They devour sorcery. It is their true sustenance. To attack a great raven with magic serves only to make the creature stronger, to bolster its immunity. Crone is the firstborn. Rake believes the potential within her is appalling, and so he keeps her and her ilk close. What a cool concept, the flesh of a god creating maggots that hash into great ravens that <laughs> devour sorcery. So cool. I don't know if it's cool is the word I'd use. It's something, all right. <laughs> it's, it's very original. I love that. Yeah. So the ravens devouring sorcery, I wonder how Hairlock was killing the great ravens when he was crossing the Reavy Plain. Maybe he's using chaos, and chaos is the thing they can't yeah. consume. They can consume everything else. Yeah, that's got to be what it is. It's, it's, it has to do something with the chaos being unformed or something. Therefore, I guess they can't handle it. So it's a very intriguing thought, though. Why was Hairlock able to take them down? Corlat paused, then faced Whiskey Jack and said, Commander Whiskey Jack, in Darugistan, we clashed with a mage of yours. Whiskey Jack said, Aye, quick Ben. He'll be here shortly, and I will have his thoughts on all this. Corlat said, The man you mentioned earlier to the child. I admit to a certain admiration for the wizard, and so look forward to meeting him. Their gazes locked, and she said, And I am pleased to have met you as well. Silver Fox spoke true words when she said she trusted you, and I believe I do as well. He shifted uncomfortably, then said, There has been scant contact between us that would earn such trust, Corlat. Nonetheless, I will endeavor to earn it. Man, this guy. You can't help but love him. Dude, Whiskey Jack is the man, dude. He is the man. The man! Okay. <laughs> I mean, who talks like that? He's very humble. Yeah, he's very, very humble. Corlat said, The child has had her sail within her, a woman who knew you well. Though I never met the sorceress, I find that the woman she was, emerging further with each day in Silver Fox, possessed admirable qualities. Whiskey Jack slowly nodded and said, She was a friend. Corlat said, How much do you know of the events leading to this rebirth? Whiskey Jack said, Not enough, I'm afraid. We learned of Tattersail's death from Perrin, who came upon her remains. She died in the embrace of a Thelemon high mage, Bellardan, who had traveled out onto the plain with the corpse of his mate, Nightchill, presumably intending to bury the woman. Tattersail was already a fugitive, and it's likely Bellardan was instructed to retrieve her. It is as Silver Fox says, as far as I can tell. Corlat looked away and said nothing for a long time. When she finally did, her question, so simple and logical, left Whiskey Jack with a pounding heart. Commander, we sense Tattersail and Nightchill within the child and she herself admits to these two. But now I wonder, where then is this Thelomon Bellardan? Whiskey Jack could only draw a deep breath and shake his head. He thought, gods, I don't know. <laughs> and on that bombshell, <laughs> the chapter ends. Nice. Good chapter, man. A little long-winded at some points, but hey. <laughs> yeah, a lot of inner monologue there, but pretty important. Very important detail. For standout moments, learning the details of the bureaucracy in Kapustan. I so love red tape. It's wonderful. <laughs> Tremendous red tape in the bush shell. Tremendous red tape. I'm sorry. <laughs> There's a great movie, The In-Laws, where they talk. He works for the CIA, and he's telling this story about something talking about tre <laughs> tremendous red tape in the jungle shell. Tremendous red tape. You know, it's like, it's like it's all this red tape. I, I, it's always a delight to see it spelled out for comic effect. Right. Finding out the details of the Teneskauri horde within the Panyan Domin. Horrific. That is extremely disturbing. <laughs> it's an extremely disturbing way to do an army. It bothers me deeply. It does. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I'll never forget. I know that this stands out bad for you because when I was talking about this book to you, when I when I first read it, you're like, oh, it's mm. like you you mentioned, have you got to the tennis gallery yet? I'm like, oh, yeah. You're like, oh, you're like, uh. mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And that's not even the worst thing about the Panion Domin. No, 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 <laughs> no. Nope.
I enjoyed the scene where Crone notes how similar Brood and Dujak are. That is cool, and I appreciate the fact that they are, in fact, really similar. And there's, there's a, this respect and ab- almost an admiration between the two for each other. Like, wow, we really do think a lot alike on certain things. It's pretty good. Yeah, it's like you meet somebody and you're like, man, I really like this guy. Yeah, yeah this, guy's, <laughs> this guy's pretty cool. Whiskey Jack backhanding Calor in the face and Brood holding <laughs> Calor back. That scene right there. Mm. Yeah. Now that's a core man there, and what a fantastic scene. Good golly. Just that. Uh, that's twice in two books someone gets slapped in the back of the face. Was it Tene Baralta smacking that one fella in the face? <laughs> yeah. in, 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 uh, in Dead House pretty early on. Let me you caress know? the other we, side of your face. You yes. Never. <laughs> yes. And here we go. Pretty much, Almost at the exact same point. We're on chapter three. Someone's getting smacked in the face again. Uh-huh. Chapter three. It's like, huh. Finding out that all of the Talani mass are converging. Why do I have bizarre imagery of certain eye mass rolling up in a VW microbus, smoking a lot of weed like skeletal hippies? <laughs> I don't, I don't know why I've got this Woodstock imagery going. Cause like we're going to the, we're going to the gathering, man. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. That's wrong. I shouldn't think it this way. This is horrifying. I'm trying to put a positive spin on this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it could be quite terrifying otherwise. Oh my, well, if everyone's frightened of that one group and they're all coming, it's like, well, who's all, you know, who's, who's all this all we're hearing about, you know, yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> seeing the carefully edited version of history that Silver Fox is presenting, I think says a lot about her. Yeah. Getting more details about the birth of the great Ravens. That was pretty cool. Oh yeah. And it's, it is very interesting. It's somewhat disturbing i find it very intriguing that crone you know talks about don't say no one knows and that Corlin's like we all know (laughs) (laughs) whatever was bothered by it we don't care (laughs) (laughs) but she's the only one that thinks no i know it's like no one knows no hush it's like you know of course yeah we all know you right no rick's known about that for a long time are you kidding me we've known about that for a long time a hundred thousand years we know about that (laughs) and finally bellardan yeah where is Bellardan? Good question. <laughs> That's a daggum good question. All right, Billy, great job tonight. Hey, I agree. Great job, man. Great chapter. You got any final thoughts before we drop off here? Man, just what a lot of info, heavy info dropped here. Really cool stuff in the tent with Whiskey Jack, Cowler, and Brood. Man, I, I just love as we get deeper. It's just so cool, especially if you see these powers come together. I mean, we've not seen powerful commanders, per se, gathered to do something with intent like this. I'm excited to see where this goes and what they're up against. Definitely. Cool. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. Hey, we'll see y'all next week. We thank you all for joining us today. Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us, and we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com, where you can find our Patreon link. Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com.